We are in the presence of basketball royalty. Martin Inglesby, head coach for the ascending Delaware program. You remember him dazzling on the court as a player for Notre Dame, then spent many years on their staff, and then parlayed that into getting the head coaching job with the Blue Hens. He is on Twitter at Blue Hen Inglesby. I'm Brian Fenley with Fox Sports Radio. I'm on Twitter at Brian Fenley. And one of the first things, Martin, when I was doing my due diligence on your career and I certainly watched you as a player in those Notre Dame days, was a quote that I found from Mike Bray. And he was describing you and he said, quote, Martin Inglesby has that it factor that can't be taught. He said, Martin is a true educator that young people believe in, close quote. What makes you so relatable to your players? That's a great question. I appreciate that quote from Coach, from Coach yeah. Bray. Um, you know, I just think it's kind of a, you know, quiet uh, confidence. And, you know, that's kind of who I was as a basketball player. And, um, you know, just being really unselfish and, you know, trying to connect with people and trying to have those conversations and, you know, have fun on the court, have fun off the court, um, be a good team guy. And, you know, that's really what I've tried to bring to the University of Delaware. I want guys excited to come to practice. I want to be able to connect with them on the court and off the court, be a confidence giver, be a positive guy. I've learned that so much from, you know, spending time with Mike Bray and having the opportunity to play for him and also uh, to be able to be on the staff for 13 years, you know, and trying to be a sponge and soak it all in. And, you know, I think kids nowadays may be a little different than when we came up or, you know, when my father played. You know, obviously those times are different, um, but just being able to connect with guys and develop really strong, powerful relationships. And again, um, it's kind of who I am as a person, uh, my values, um, you know, what I was brought up, um, the standards and expectations from my parents. And then I try to relate that to our players. Your players, from what I've learned from you and certainly hearing how you described your ability to, to teach them and get your points across, it, it's, it's fascinating to hear how, like you said, the mind of a player today is different and how you have to adjust the way you teach them and coach them in a way to get the most out of them. What's different about getting your point across, say, to players today as it would be, say, when you were playing at Notre Dame and just how the coach goes about motivating and encouraging his guys and, and trying to get the most out of them as well. Well, I mean, it's not a dictatorship. I think I, um, something that I learned from Coach Bray and, you know, my, I grew up in a basketball family. My, my dad was my high school coach, I think, ever since I could remember. Um, and we always had really strong, powerful discussions. And it was always a two-way street. And it wasn't him talking down to me. I think he really valued that communication and, you know, seeing it from both sides. And that's really what I've tried to bring to, um, in, you know, my coaching style and how I communicate with our players that, you know, a lot of times when I go into our staff meetings uh, or coach uh, player meetings and, and watch film, I really ask those guys, you know, what do you guys think? What do you see? Because I really value that input. Obviously, we see things a little differently on the sidelines as much as I love to be out there with our guys. They have great insights and great instincts. And, you know, I think as guys have gotten a feel for our system, and kind of our standards and beliefs and what we value, you know, they start talking for me and yeah. thinking me like me. And, you know, that is something that was a challenge as I got the head coaching job at Delaware is things weren't just going to be like it was at Notre Dame. And sure. I think I thought it would be a little more of a seamless transition. Hey, we're going to play this way. It's the type of kids we're going to bring in and it's just going to click. Um, you know, that was not the case. And, you know, I think we did some of our best coaching in the first couple of years, just trying to teach our guys, um, you know, who we are, what we value, the expectations of how hard we have to work on a daily basis. Um, but again, it goes back to your question of, uh, I think kids nowadays, they want to have a voice. I think you've seen it across the NCA that, yeah. you know, we've given our student athletes more of a voice to be able to speak up and, and share their thoughts and beliefs and, you know, allow them to stand for what they believe in. And, 
it kind of translates to the basketball court that I'm not just going to tell these guys what to do. We give our guys a lot of freedom on the basketball court to, to make mistakes and play through mistakes. And I think that's where you get the best out of them, that they're not looking over your shoulder all the time when they do make a mistake in fear of coming out of the game that, you know, our key guys know they're going to get their reps and get their minutes and they're going to be held accountable for mistakes, but they're not going to be yo-yoed back and forth um, you know, when they are making too many of those mistakes. So, um, you know, I just think giving guys confidence, giving them freedom, let them play through mistakes and also valuing that, that one-on-one interaction and two-on-two and whatever it may be to be able to really, you know, hear from them. Delaware head coach Martin Inglesby is with us. I'm Brian Finley with Fox Sports Radio. Having their voice validated must do so much for the team's well-being and the team's morale and getting the most out of them and as an entity. And yeah, you have every single year precipitously gotten your program better and better from the wins, from the program building, as you said, laying that foundation. So far, Martin, what's the proudest, most, I guess the, the singular proudest moment, I should say, of your era so far in Delaware? Um, you know, I'm not sure it's, it's what we've done on the basketball court. I think it's the culture that we've developed and the relationships that I've built with our players that guys are proud to wear a Delaware basketball shirt or put on a polo or those guys want to come back and engage with our, uh, program, uh, the conversations, the relationships that I've built with those guys, you know, those last way more than the wins and the losses. And, I think that is what, you know, we're trying to do here and, and, you know, help our guys get a degree, give them the tools to be successful and also hopefully have a chance to win a championship. Um, you know, we've had a lot of great wins. We've had some really, really tough losses. Uh, we've learned from some tough experiences, but you got to keep a great perspective on things and continue to build and, and focus on the next task at hand. Um, and, you know, I love that we are extending our programs, getting better. We're getting more recognition in the CA and nationally. But when I step back and look about it, you know, the impact that you have on people is something that I find most rewarding. And those relationships that I've really developed with guys that have graduated, you know, some of the guys that have been in the program for four years, our starting backcourt, Ryan Allen and Kevin Anderson, was really the first two guys we recruited in our program. They're going to be four-year seniors, both uh, going to be 1,000-point scorers in our program. And just the depth of those relationships is something that, you know, I will really remember. I want to touch on those guys in just a moment. You did bring up that, yes, Notre Dame has more resources than Delaware, but what is something that Delaware has that can offer to a player that no other program can? I think we have unbelievable alignment from our president down to our athletic director to you know our coaches and our I think that's really, really important. Obviously, we're in a great location geographically up at 95 corridor with it's a fabulous academic institution that, you know, when you graduate from the University of Delaware, whenever that ball stops bouncing or they take it away from you, you're going to have plentiful opportunities to go out there and be successful in the real world. And our athletic director, Chrissy Raywalk, has done a great job kind of developing a leadership program for us to, um, you know, develop the whole self here and wants guys to be able to experience more than basketball. And there's life skills, there's leadership training, all kinds of programming that these guys got to take advantage of. But they know when they graduate from Delaware that they're going to be a blue hen for life. And that is something that I think speaks, um, you know, speaks to the type of university that we have here in Delaware. There's such a, a drive for success and you are pushing yourself, you're pushing your team to get to that next level one in which when you took over the program, they hadn't really felt before. How are you learning to be at ease with the work that you are doing? Because I would think as a coach, as someone as, as driven as you are, that there is that one voice in the back of your head that says, did I do enough in, in practice? Did I do enough getting them ready for this game? Did I do enough for this? And at one point you just have to say, look, I can only do so much and this is the work I've done and it is good enough. And guess what? It will work. How do you deal with those voices in your head that are always 
pushing you more and more. But again, there's only so much you can do that's humanly possible. No, it's a great question. And I can't tell you how many times I drive up and down 95, <laughs> I-95. It's like my, how I meditate. It's my therapy to think about, you know, do we do this in practice? Do we not do much? It's, you know, if you do too much, you don't do anything. So yeah. I try to stay true to our principles of what's important to us and pick two or three things on a daily basis that we need to work on to improve as a basketball program. And, and obviously, you know, you know, we're together a lot and it's a long season. So you got to be able to be agile. You got to be able to adapt, you know, guy goes down with an injury. You're thinking about maybe playing different ways or, you know, slowing the game down, or maybe we got to speed it up. So I think my brain is always kind of trying to find ways to, to improve and trying to throw some different wrinkles out there. But again, you know, stay true to what we do. And if we have a tough loss, get back to work the next day and have a couple of teachable moments to improve, to be better moving forward. So, um, you know, I feel I've grown as a leader, as a communicator. I still have a long way to go. I'm in a lot better place today than I was when I first got the job. Uh, again, go back to I-95, I can't tell you how many times I've called people that I trust in the profession or called Coach Bray and be like, Coach, like, I have no idea what I'm doing here, but like, can you help me deal with this yeah. situation? How to give this guy confidence or how to earn a two or three game losing streak. Um, what can I do to kind of pick our team up or kind of change things? I know we don't need to reinvent the wheel. You know, I think as a young coach, like this didn't work. Oh, we got to do this. We got to do this. We got to do this. Like you cannot do that. And you got to pick one or two things that we can work on on the defensive end or maybe look at a different strategy offensively or a different entry, but, you know, continue to focus on those good habits on a daily basis. And, um, you know, if you do that, I think you can put your head down at night and um, try to sleep easy as best you can. As best you can, because I don't think you could ever turn off a coach's brain. You, you can certainly try but there's only so much you can do. And like you said, there's always going to be some second guessing, but great on you to obviously tap into the network you have as far as mentors and coaches that are there to lend support and to help you grow and learn how to deal with various situations. And now I want to get into the situation you have as a team right now. You, you spoke upon a couple guys that will be seniors. What does this team look like? Obviously, with the news of Nate Darling, that's a guy who meant so much to you and, and certainly will be missed. And so where do you find ways to fill his void as well? Well, I mean, you know, it's hard to replace a guy like Nate. Um, this pandemic hasn't been too kind to the Blue Hens. We lost Justin Mutz in, in uh, early June to Virginia Tech. And then Nate went through the uh, draft process and he and his family decided it was best for him to uh, turn pro and start that part of his career. Um, you know, I've kind of been re-energized now that we got that decision, just thinking about our team and who we can become. Uh, we have three starters back from last year's team, uh, the, the most experience returning backcourt in the CAA and Ryan Allen and Kevin Anderson and then a low post guy in Dylan Painter who played half the season for us last year he's a transfer from Villanova I just think he's going to have a monster senior year for us so really relying on those guys uh, as leaders and you know kind of empowering them to be the voice for our team those guys want that responsibility they understand it's important for them to you know lead this group and lead by example and as we know it's you know I was a captain at Notre Dame my senior year it, it's taxing and it's not just worrying about myself individually it's uh, you know, trying to find out, find ways to help the team grow and, and be better and have that responsibility on your shoulders. And that's where I have to try to pull that out of those guys even more than what they were doing last year. Each of them have a, has a different way of communicating and, and having that voice, but collectively as a group, you know, we're going to go as far as those guys take us. Those guys will be the identity of your team. And yes, you will sort of get some new, influx of players as well to help out but what will be your brand of basketball certainly you won't deviate a whole lot from what you've done the last couple of years with the group you have but if you were to say all right we are going to streamline things a little bit this year or do things a tad differently where would that be the case 
I think we're going to stay true to who we are on the offensive end, um, you know, with our motion offense and our principles and, and just being unselfish and unpredictable and really valuing guys being able to read and react and, and share the basketball. I think the biggest area of growth and maybe, you know, the consistency has to be at a high level is on the defensive end. You know, we were pretty potent offensively last year. I think we were second in the league in scoring. Uh, we could put the ball on the hoop. We almost had five double-digit scores. But, you know, can we be better and more consistent on the defensive end? And, you know, what do we need to do to be better there? I do think we have uh, more pieces that are willing to defend on the defensive end and, and be more consistent there. Uh, it's got to be by committee on the defensive backboard. But I think as we get back to work in September, really focusing on, um, you know, our principles and our habits on the defensive end and really setting those standards to build on moving forward. Uh, we have not been as consistent. We have not been as good on the defensive end. And, um, but I do think this group has some interchangeable pieces where we can be um, more together more cohesive, um, a better unit on the defensive end. And I think that will help us. Have you had a chance before September to get the whole team together? Has, have you been able to kind of squeeze in some workouts? Because if so, I'm sure they were sparing. And it must be such a relief now to finally get guys on the court and, and get back to playing the game you love when – for so many weeks, we were wondering when we could all, you know, unite as far as teams and players and, and getting basketball started up again. Yeah, my joke with our beat writer the other day, I said I felt the first day on July 20th when we were out on the court with a couple of our guys. It was like Christmas morning when yeah. you're six years old. You know, those guys were so excited. They're smiling. Now, you can't see the smiles as much as you used to when guys, have, when guys are wearing masks. But, um, you know, July 20th was the first day we were able to get out with our guys. They allowed us to have two coaches and up to five players. And, you know, I, I just want to give credit to, you know, the health advisory committee and, and and the doctors and the trainers here at Delaware for all the procedures and protocol they had in place. They did a fabulous job to kind of re our student athletes back to campus. Um, but it, it was fabulous. I think for all of our mental health and psyche, just to be able to be on the court with our guys. And it wasn't necessarily, oh, we're going to run this play or we're going to do that. It's more just guys having a ball in their hands, working on their fundamentals, and just being able to connect with them. As you know, like our sport, it's such relationship-based and sure. getting to know guys and helping them grow as men. And to not have that for so long was – was really hard. It was a heck of a challenge to, you know, send guys home in mid-March and then, hey, we'll see you in two weeks. And then all of a sudden it's, we'll see you in a month. We'll see you in, see you in and the news kept getting worse. Yeah. So yeah. just trying to keep those guys upbeat and positive, uh, lead with optimism. Um, that's kind of has always been my philosophy. And, um, you know, and then it's going to be hopefully – it's going to get better and keep yes. those blinders on, stay off social media, yes. <laughs> just focus on, you know, to focus on your academics and focus on, you know, getting stronger and get your conditioning in and we'll be back together soon enough. So that's kind of been my message. I, I can't wait to see the joy on your face when you do have everybody together. And speaking of a coach in his thoughts, being in your mind and in listening and trying to figure out where you're going with, how am I going to start this practice? What am I going to do this day when we get together? And it's just a constant stream of positivity and just excitement that you get to be back with your players. As we wrap up here with you, Coach, and again, so grateful to, to have you on and your, your time is so valuable, so really do appreciate it. A couple guys, one that you played with and then one who you coached at Notre Dame. I wanted to get your perspective on them as far as some maybe a story behind the scenes which made both of these guys special for one Pat Connaughton and then Troy Murphy and why oh, these geez. yeah <laughs> oh, so tell me, you go oh geez with Troy Troy Murphy you, you got a story or two <laughs> I'm not sure I can put on the Zoom call, but, um, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on Pat first. Okay. Uh, you know, Pat is an unbelievable story. Um, I'll never forget. Um, so background, my wife's brother 
played at Williams College with Pat Connaughton's AAU coach. Oh my God! So that's kind of how we got connected. And Mike had re- Mike Crotty is his name. He runs the Middlesex Magic. He reached out and said, "Hey, you know, I love Notre Dame. I know you from you know your brother-in-law. Blah blah blah. I think I have a kid for you." And, you know, you get a lot of those calls, you get sure. a lot of emails, you're really hoping that he does and he's good enough. Um, and, you know, that's kind of how our uh, relationship with Pat Connaughton started. We, uh, one of our assistants, Rod Bolanas, flew out to Massachusetts to watch him. And I think in the first game, he had 20 points and like 25 rebounds. Oh. You know, Pat is a guy that's six, four and a half, but unbelievable athleticism. You've seen in the dunk contest. Um, and, you know, just really started to make a name for us. Luckily for us, he's an Irish Catholic kid. And once we started recruiting him, we got in there a little earlier than everybody else. He was a top 100 recruit by the end of the summer. And we were fortunate to get him into our program. And one of the best leaders and teammates that I've ever been around. Wow. Um, just had a presence about him. Everybody loved him. He was able to push guys. He worked his butt off uh, in the weight room on the basketball court. And he improved every year. And, you know, we used to talk all the time about, you know, you get good kids in your program and you make them better basketball players. And that's what Pat Connaughton was able to do. When he came to Notre Dame, I'm not sure he could dribble two or three dribbles with his left hand. <laughs> Wow. But he worked his butt off in the gym, in skill instruction, in practice, and just obviously worked himself into the, I think, 42nd pick in the NBA draft. And, and he was an elite baseball player. He got drafted, I believe, in the third or fourth round by the Baltimore Orioles. He could throw some heat. He'd be in the gym <laughs> throwing around with Coach Bray and our guys every now and then. But, um, you know, just an unbelievable person. You know, he, he's the – you know, prototypical, like Notre Dame man. Sure. And couldn't be more excited for his uh, progression and his success in the NBA and even all the other ventures that he's doing outside of his basketball in the NBA. He started a real estate, I think, development company, um, you know, building houses and, and condos all over the place. But a guy that's going to be extremely successful whenever you know his basketball days are over now Troy Murphy uh so Troy and I played together for three years he's a great friend of mine um obviously an unbelievable talented basketball player and and a guy that was a lottery pick in the NBA uh played 10 plus years in the NBA um you know Troy Troy was an interesting guy he got a great personality like to have a lot of fun when we were on campus he lived in Morrissey Manor which was across from Fisher Hall where I lived um, in the quad and he lived on the first floor. So sometimes he didn't want to go in the front door of the dorm and he would climb in the, in and out of the window of his dorm room just to be able to sneak in <laughs> Wow! <laughs> as a six eleven guy. But, uh, you know, Troy was, you know, a great friend, great teammate. And I think he's living in, out in Las Vegas now, started his own little company and business out there. But um, he was a character. He liked to have a lot of fun. And I can only imagine him in the days of social media now. He would oh, have a very yeah. strong presence and voice. But uh, he's a really, really good guy. Great teammate. And one of the best players I ever played, again, played with. Last question for you. What would, if I were to ask him, hey, tell me about this Martin guy. How would he <laughs> turn it around and describe you when you were yeah. with him at school? I was a great friend because I was the one that would get him the ball all the time. All I do is we'd run plays. I throw it to him and get out of the way. Yeah. Uh, but you know, Troy and I, um, you know, we had a great relationship. Again, I was the point guard on that team. Um, I had to keep a lot of guys happy. We had two first round picks in Ryan Humphrey and, and Troy Murphy. Matt Carroll played in the NBA. We had a really, really good team. Um, you know, I think a guy that great teammate, uh, worked hard. Uh, we had a lot of fun off the court <laughs> together. Um, he used to call me Moose. That was my nickname back in the day at Notre Dame. Still is a little bit today. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that would be the first. If you asked Martin Ingram, he'd be like, Moose. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'll tell you a quick story. So yeah. back in the day, you probably, the media guys, they would put, you, know, you have questions, you have to have, answer questions in the media guy, you know, what's your favorite pe- food? What's your favorite this? And yeah. one of the questions was, um, what's one thing people don't know about you? And my response was, I hate being called Marty. So one of the guys on the team said, uh, we're not going to call you Marty, but watching National Lampoon's Vacation, they go to Wally World, and one of the characters is Marty the Moose. I don't know if you've seen <laughs> it. I bring back any memories. So instead of calling me Marty, 
moose kind of just stuck and that's what those guys called me you know wow. <laughs> so, a great crazy story to end, end the interview but i'm sure that's what uh you know murph would get a kick out of that because you just always give me a hard time about it oh my gosh that that's fascinating and if if i could have only been a part of you guys and those fun interactions off the court at notre dame and just sounds like you guys had an absolute blast and Martin, I, I'm so thankful for your time. Your program is on the rise at Delaware, and it is in very good hands with you at the helm from Notre Dame and all the experiences there on their staff to now getting this opportunity. And every single year, you continue to impress and will do so. You really are one of the the bright superstars in the college basketball ranks, and I'm Again, really, really appreciative of your time. Thanks so much. Well, thanks, Brad. I appreciate those kind words. And you make sure to stay safe out there on the West Coast. Anytime. Look forward to connecting again soon.